blessed. Are we blessed? Amen. Amen. I invite your attention to 1 Samuel chapter 1 this, this morning as we make preparation for a different kind of service. I'm going to go on notice by saying that I would love to have four or five, six or seven of these kinds of services every year. There once was an old lady who lived in a shoe. She had so many children, she didn't know what to do. Someone asked her one time, ma'am, if you had it to do over again, would you have all these kids? She said immediately, oh yes, but not these. It is not uncommon for us as parents to come to the point sometimes of simply not knowing what to do with our kids. And concerning the subject of today's message, there may have been times when we wanted to give our kids back to God, but only to find out that he has a no return policy. However, as Christians, we believe that our children are a gift from God. They belong to him. We have them as children for such a short time. They grow up way too fast. And while we have any influence over our lives, we believe that God expects us as parents to rear them in the ways of the Lord. Therefore, give me a church filled with children because it means it is a church that is growing. Along with children comes noise. They're going to be loud from time to time. They will occasionally be noisy. They may even be rambunctious. But God created those children. His words tell us that when certain people tried to turn the children away from him, Jesus took them to himself. Jesus loves the children. And a church should do no less. Give me the noise. Because that means there are children here. And children aren't just the church of tomorrow. They are the church of today. This is our platform for ministry. COVID-19 has been rougher on the kids than, as I said earlier, than on us as adults. Therefore, next Sunday, March 21st, we will resume Sunday school. And I'm happy to announce that Sunday school will begin at 945, and kids' church will respectively follow at the appropriate time. Having a ministry dedicated to spiritual growth for our kids. Our virtual Bible school, vacation Bible school prep has begun. Our VBS program for 2021 is entitled Treasured. Embark on a quest through hidden ruins, ancient caves, and dense jungles as treasured VBS kids dig into action-packed, faith-filled adventures, they will discover God's greatest treasure is not diamonds, gems, or gold. It is them. We're going to try through social, virtual VBS to reach 200 kids. That's going to be a challenge. So but we're enlisting all the churches of the Lone Oak Baptist Association. Then there's youth camp. Next camp this summer didn't have youth camp last year, but this year we're planning for next camp, July 26th through July 30th. It is more of a teen camp, and it will be at Bog Springs. There were many blessings in my youth at Bog Springs. That's where I surrendered to preach. 
All these efforts and more are designed to encourage, to motivate, and to train our church children in the ways of the Lord. And this is just a part of an ongoing effort of giving our children to God. So 1 Samuel chapter 1 and verse 26. Pardon me, the words of Hannah. Pardon me, my Lord. As surely as you live, I am the woman who stood beside you praying to the Lord. I prayed for this child, and the Lord granted me what I asked of him. So now I give him to the Lord. For his whole life, he will be given over to the Lord. 1 Samuel chapter 1 gives us this classic example of Hannah bringing her son Samuel to the Lord and handing young Samuel over to Eli the priest. Hannah was a woman whose prayer was used by God to bring into to bring into existence the first and in some ways the greatest of the prophets of Israel, a man who would become a spiritual guide and mentor for the first two great kings of Israel. This is the story of told to us in four simple movements that center around first Hannah's pain, then her prayer, then her peace, and finally her praise. For Hannah had a problem. And we're reading in verse 1 of 1 Samuel chapter 1 that there was a certain man of Ramathim Zophim of the hill country of Ephraim whose name was Elkanah, the son of Jeremiah Odom, son of Elihu, son of Tohu, son of Zuth, and Ephesian, whatever he is. He had two wives, and the name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Peninnah. Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. Now, this man used to go up year by year from his city to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh. There were two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas were priests of the Lord. And on the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Peninnah, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But although he loved Hannah, he would give Hannah only one portion because the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival, Peninnah, used to provoke her. Surely she irritated her. Because the Lord had given, had left Hannah childless. So Hannah longed to have a baby. She was married, and she was naturally expected and hoped to feel the first signs of pregnancy. But as months and years upon years went by, she remained childless. She felt an ache in her arms and her heart as she longed to have a son. And what it made, made it worse was the other wife. She seemed to have a baby every time she turned around. And just as regularly as the seasons came, there was a new son or daughter to the family so that the house was filled with children, but none of them were Hannah's. The ache in her heart deepened as time went by, and and the final agony was that Peninnah could not keep quiet about her fertility. She found a thousand and one ways to remind Hannah that she was without a child. She taunted her, mocked her, and every word sank deeply into the spirit of Hannah. Hannah grieved over her barren life and shuddered at what her rival was saying to her. But the most difficult thing that Hannah faced is recorded twice in the scriptures that we've read in 1 Samuel chapter 1, and that is because the Lord had chosen Hannah to be childless. Twice we were told that her problem came from the Lord. We would rather believe that this, if anything, came from the devil. But the book of Job reminds us that the devil can do nothing to us except what the Lord gives him permission to do. It was God who chose Hannah to be childless. Now, it was God who made her a woman. He gave her the capacity of motherhood. He put the hunger in her heart for a baby, the desire year after year to fulfill her ability as a woman to be a mother. But this account tells us plainly, so plainly, that it just did not happen. It was God who prevented her from having this baby. 
And the story of Hannah teaches us that God gave her the problem in order that she might bring it to him to find the solution that he had in mind. And we see that this, as an account going forward, brings us to Hannah's prayer. Look at verse 7, 1 Samuel chapter 1. So it went on year by year, year by year. And as often as she went up to the house of the Lord, Penia used to provoke her. There Hannah wept and could not eat. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? These were the occasions of the offering of the annual tithes in Israel at the house of the Lord, which is at Shiloh at this time. It was a custom for men to sell their cattle and sheep and to bring the money to the house of God in Shiloh. There they would purchase an animal to offer as a sacrifice. They would gather around as a family and eat the animal in the presence of the Lord as guests of the Lord at his house. Very much like we observe the Lord's Supper today. It was a custom to give every woman and her children a certain portion of meat. But of course, Penia and her children received the greater portion of the sacrifice. Hannah getting only one portion because she had no children. So it was time when her childlessness, this was the time that her childlessness came home to her and hurt more sharply than any other time. And when Penia, her rival, would provoke her more severely on these occasions than in any other occasion, taunting her and mocking her because she was childless. Then the account goes on to say in verse 9, that after they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. And she was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. She vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look upon my affliction of thy maidservant and remember me and not forget thy maidservant, thou but will give to thy maidservant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall touch his head. She continued praying before the Lord. Eli the priest observed her. He saw her mouth moving, but he heard no words. And so he thought, you know, he, went, he thought that she was drunk. Eli said to her, how long will you be drunken? Put away your wine from you. But Hannah answered, no, Lord. I am a woman surely troubled. I have neither, I've drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your maidservant as a base woman, for all along I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and my vexation. At first glance, this is a kind of bargaining prayer from Hannah. Now she's offering to give a boy back to the Lord only if he will give him to her first so that she can enjoy him. It is possible to read this in that way, but if we look closely at it, we can see what is really happening. For this is not the first time. Year after year, she had prayed these prayers. But this year, it came to her in her agony and pain that God had a purpose in doing it this way. Her prayer was different this time. Thinking deeply about her problems, she realized for the first time that something she had never known before. She realized that children are not just for parents, they are for the Lord. They were given to parents alone for a while, but the reason they were given to us is for the Lord to use. And this is as Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, that the body is for the Lord. That is what our bodies is for, that we might be used of God. And certainly this account indicates the fact that this little boy that was ultimately born, Samuel, was God's man to meet the need of a nation. 
God had taught Hannah through these deep hours of struggle and distress. And she prays that God would have what God wanted. A man for his glory and his purposes. And that God would bless Hannah with a son to accomplish God's plan, God's design. And immediately we read of a quite remarkable change in Hannah's heart. For the account says in verse 17, Eli answered, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition with you, which you have made to him. And she said, Let your maidservant find favor in your eyes. Then the woman went her way and ate, and her countenance was no longer sad. Immediately, the peace that passes all understanding, Philippians 4, 7, that began to guard her heart and spirit. Now the birth of the baby did not occur until months later, but when the baby was born, she named him Samuel, which means ask, ask of God. God granted her request, but there was peace in Hannah's heart right from that very moment of her prayer. And this is a beautiful commentary on Philippians chapter 4 in which Paul tells us, Have no anxiety about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. You would expect to read and your prayers will be answered, but what it goes on to say is that, and the peace of God which passes all understanding The peace of God which which cannot be explained will guard your hearts and mind, will guard your emotions in Christ Jesus. And that is what Hannah experienced here. Pardon me, my Lord. As surely as you live, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. I prayed for this child and the Lord has granted me what I ask of him. So now I give him to the Lord. For his whole life, he has, was, has been given over to the Lord. We learn from Hannah, confirmation. Giving a child to the Lord is a confirmation of, of a parent's love for God, as well as their love for the child. One cannot properly love a child without loving God. This is exactly what Hannah is doing. She is demonstrating that her love and fear of God was supreme in her life above all else. Remember the words of Jesus in Matthew 10. Anyone who loves his father more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. As you obey God with your life and as you give that child back to God, you're positioning that child to receive the absolute best of life. By giving a child back to God, you're declaring that God has a special divine plan and purpose for his or her life. And you're posturing yourself and the child to discover his purpose plan and obey it. Confirmation. But there's also clarification. Giving a child to the Lord is a clarification of ownership. Parents have the privilege to train and love the child, but the child belongs to the Lord. And when you give your child back to God, you're openly declaring this child is a gift from God. This child does not really belong to me. This child belongs to God. I have the privilege to love and train this child, but this child is not mine, but God's. Was this not what? was on Hannah's mind when she approached Eli with young Samuel. He was about five years old at this time. She was not saying, Lord, this, this young man belongs. Was she not saying, Lord, this, this young man belongs to you, not me? You do with him as you please. He's yours. Yes. We need to realize as parents that our children do not belong to us, they belong to God. They are a precious gift from God on loan to us. Children are an heritage to the Lord and a fruit of the womb is his reward. One of the glaring symptoms of our society today is the, the depth of depravity that we have sunk to regarding the treatment of our children. 
children belong to God. And we need to be incredibly careful how we care for the children of this world. One of the words of Jesus, when they hindered children from coming to him, he said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. And I've always marveled the words in Matthew chapter 18 of Jesus when he talks about a child. He said, if anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and be drawn into the depths of the sea. And I will go on record as saying that anyone today who abuses an innocent child, a child, whether innocent or not, the Lord's got an appointment with them and it's an appointment of judgment. And he said, I will take care of this when you stand before me. Jesus absolutely loves the little children, all the children of the world. Giving a child to the Lord is commitment as well, to rear the child under the lordship of Christ. Ephesians 6 says that we're to nurture and bring our children up in the admonition of the Lord, that is to in training and instruction of the Lord. To give a child to God is not just a ceremony. It is a commitment. It is a commitment that you're going to be a godly parent. Love Jesus supremely. Teach this child of Christ. Keep this child in church. Love this child. Pray for this child. Train this child. Make, make the home holy. Put away worldliness. Live a righteous life. Keep Jesus Christ as Lord of your home. That's the commitment. Some people may think a baby dedication is a magical ceremony, but this, but this means nothing. It means zero if we're not making a sincere, lifelong commitment to raise this child under the lordship of Jesus Christ. And then there's the claiming. Giving a child to the Lord is claiming God's plan and promise for the child. Your children are blessed by your obedience to God and cursed by your disobedience to God. As you obey God with your life, as you give that child back to God, you're positioning that child to receive God's absolute best for his life. By giving that child back to God, you're declaring that God has a special divine plan and purpose for the child's life and you're posturing yourself and the child not only to discover that plan but to obey it as well. Did I see Shelby Lee? I haven't got my glasses on. Let me put my glasses on so I can see you. My eyesight prevents me from wearing my glasses as I read. Cody, come forward, please. Dory, would you check on Shelby, see if she's delayed, please? Okay. It happens. Cody has mic number one, Elizabeth. We're glad and, to, and blessed to have uh, Cody's and Shelby's family with us today. We're, would, you, would all of y'all come forward, please? Cody's family. I want you to stand behind Cody and Shelby here. So just come on. Don't be shy. You're dedicating your life to live a godly life before this child as well as Cody and Shelby. Just form a half moon around them. I told Shelby this morning, I said, 
to be just a few weeks old and already in charge. We've seen that illustrated right now, haven't we? Our Sunday school teachers, Becky, Sharon, would y'all come join us as well? This is a family dedication, a public commitment by Cody and Shelby to raise LB in a home that honors Christ. We believe that children are a gift from God and I am excited that Cody and Shelby are willing to publicly declare their commitment to rear LV in the instructions of the Lord. Cody, Shelby, this is a public commitment you make before God, you make before your church as well as your family. This is your opportunity to express publicly your desire to lead and spiritually nurture LB in cooperation with the Holy Spirit so that he would develop a desire to love God and love others. It is, of course, our hope that by providing this home environment that LB will someday come to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And your commitment to have a home that honors Christ by living out your faith in Christ increases the likelihood that this young man will one day make his own personal commitment to Christ. And this is not just the commitment of Cody and Shelby. Your parents, grandparents, aunts and uncles, we call upon you to live a life of godliness before LB. This is your dedication as well. Not only do you declare your love for Shelby and Cody and LB, but you declare your love for the Lord in your commitment to this child. And, and this is not just a commitment of Cody and Shelby and their family. It is a commitment of this church, First Mabelville, to provide ministry and training in an atmosphere of worship and Christ-like love for the purpose of teaching LB as, and as many as we can in every way that the Lord leads us to influence the lives of boys and girls in our outreach. And that's why I've asked Becky and Sharon as our Sunday school teachers for our youth to represent the church in this dedication. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer and Cody's going to lead our prayer. Dear grace, help you follow the Lord. I just thank you for this glorious day you've given us. And Lord, we fully understand that Giving him up to you, Lord, is not just the end of it, Lord. It's actually the beginning. We understand that we're to that you're going to give us the patience and the courage and the and the provision to to aid LB in his growth in you, his growth physically, his growth mentally. Lord, I just ask, I just thank you for this blessing you've given us. Even though he likes to grunt and whine and make weird noises sometimes, Lord, we know it's, it's life. Lord, I just thank you for this church, for their love, for their acceptance. I thank you for our family, Lord, and their aid in helping us in this endeavor. And I just ask that you give us the patience, the courage, the provision to aid us into growing Lewis, both as a Christian and as a good person in the world, Lord. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Go ask the family, go back to your seats, ask Cody and Shelby to stay here for a moment long. Brother Daryl, lead us in the song. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, 
I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, yielded and still. We prepared a little memento of this day for Cody and Shelby of this dedication. Like I said, I'd love to have many of these every year. If you want, if you want one, let me know. We'll do it. <laughs> Thank you for your presence. I hope that you've been blessed. Have you been blessed today? All right. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Brother Steve James, lead us, please. 